Boa noite. É, primeiramente, em nome do Centro Ruth Cardoso, gostaria de agradecer a presença de todos. Eu sei que hoje está sendo um desafio o deslocamento pela cidade, né? E que bom que vocês conseguiram chegar. Que bom que nós vamos ter um, um grande encontro. O evento de hoje é em parceria com Fronteiras do Pensamento. E tem a honra de apresentar o filósofo Josué Lin, é, que promoverá uma reflexão sobre a tragédia da moralidade sem isso comum. Para, para fazer essa mediação desse debate, nós teremos Eduardo Wolff, curador assistente do projeto Fronteiras do Pensamento. Eduardo é doutor em filosofia pela USP, tem sido pesquisador é, visitante da Universidade Italiana Cafuscari, em Veneza. É também editor da plataforma Multimídia, Multimídia o Estado da Arte, no, no jornal Estado de São Paulo, e colaborador da revista Veja. Editou, entre outros, os volumes de Pensar a Filosofia e Pensar a o Contemporâneo, desculpa, é lançado pelo Arquipélago Editorial. É também tradutor de várias obras literárias. Em 2017, Eduardo foi secretário adjunto da Cultura de Porto Alegre. No segundo semestre, ele lançará o livro Guerra Cultural pela editora Record. Com certeza, com essa mediação e nosso convidado, nós teremos um grande evento que eh, essas reflexões pretende reverberar eh, em outras discussões. Então, eh, a ideia do centro é justamente sempre essa, eh, trazer ações que articulem e desenhem futuros desejáveis. Tenho certeza que teremos um grande encontro, agradeço mais uma vez a presença de todos e Eduardo, por favor, é com você agora. Eu vou, dizer umas, é, eu vou dizer umas brevíssimas palavras aqui de apresentação uh, e podemos passar imediatamente a palavra ao professor Green. Pode deixar, você pode deixar ali porque ele vai falar do púlpito, por gentileza? Ele vai falar do púlpito, só eu que não vou falar do púlpito. É, obrigado, muito obrigado. Então, uh, muito brevemente, eu queria dizer que é óbvio, uma grande honra, um grande privilégio poder uh, fazer essa mediação desse debate com o professor Joshua Green, da Universidade de Harvard. Uh, o professor Green tem a formação originalmente dele na área da filosofia, ele é um filósofo, uh, a partir dessa formação acabou migrando depois para a área da psicologia, especialmente uh, um tipo de pesquisa talvez ainda não muito comum no Brasil, mas que é uh, cada vez mais uh, importante nos Estados Unidos e no mundo anglo-saxão, que une a psicologia uh, evolucionista, a neurociência, trabalho com antropologia e outras áreas experimentais que dão uma concretude para a pesquisa muito interessante e conectando eh, a pesquisa na área da filosofia e da psicologia com áreas mais que a gente chamaria mais práticas, mais experimentais, eh, permitindo testes e coisas muito eh, realmente inovadoras. O professor Joshua Green eh, lançou eh, em 2013 um livro chamado Moral Tribes, as tribos morais, né? eh, cujo subtítulo justamente trazia... Eh, Uh, motion, reason, and the gap between us and them. Uh, a, a razão, a emoção e essa distância, esse abismo aí que existe entre o nós uh, e eles. Esse livro que vai sair agora este ano pela Editora Record também, vocês vão certamente se encantar com a análise do professor Green, uh, trabalha com uma perspectiva fantástica de tentar compreender como funcionam as nossas tomadas de decisões morais, como nós tomamos decisões morais, o que, que está, de alguma maneira, é, para usar uma expressão típica das pesquisas dessa área, né, hardwired nas nossa, na nossa evolução, no nosso cérebro, né, desde os nossos princípios, o que, que é, é construto social, o que, que é, é mediado pela nossa razão e, evidentemente, como isso implica, como isso tem consequências para toda a área é, da vida política, da vida em sociedade, da no, dos nossos acordos e desacordos e uma vida comum, certo? É, é portanto, um grande prazer é, anunciar é, o professor Joshua Green aqui no Centro Ruth Cardoso, nosso parceiro de longa data, e é, na quarta-feira no Fronteiras do Pensamento. Professor Green, please. Boa noite. Uh, 
I'm afraid that, that is almost all the Portuguese I know. Uh, and so I, I want to thank you for using your education to make up for the deficits in my own education. Uh, and, and thank you for, for listening. It, it is a great honor to be here. I'm very excited. This is my first time in Brazil. In fact, it's my first time in the Southern Hemisphere. But uh, you have a wonderful country and a wonderful hemisphere. Uh, and uh, I'm very excited to be here. And I'm glad that we're in this small group where we can really have a conversation um, and, and get to know each other a little bit better. Um, so, uh, muito obrigado. Thank you so much for, 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 ha for having me here. So I want to begin uh, with an interesting moment from uh, relatively recent politics in my country. Uh, but this is before Donald Trump although I think the seeds of Donald Trump uh, lie, lie in this moment I want to talk about. So this was during the 2012 presidential campaign. So this is for the re-election of Barack Obama. But at the time, we didn't know if he would be re-elected. And there was the opposition. So Barack Obama is a Democrat. On the other side are the Republicans. And there were a lot of different Republicans who early in the campaign were competing to be the Republican candidate to go up against Barack Obama. Um, and in one of these debates, so the Republicans had their debates of who, who would get to be the opposition candidate. And one of those people trying to be the candidate was uh, a, a, a senator named Ron Paul. So some of you, has anyone heard of Ron Paul? Maybe a couple? Okay, so we're a very uh, informed audience. Uh, for those of you who don't know, so Ron Paul is a fairly, what we call a libertarian and conservative uh, politician who, who believes very much that about what he says individual responsibility and not so much collective responsibility. And he got a very interesting question during this debate on this point. So someone said to him, suppose there is a young man, a young man who decides he's not going to buy health insurance. So in the United States, you don't necessarily automatically have health insurance, although uh, that's something that's changed relatively recently. Someone chooses not to buy health insurance, and then that person ends up very sick. They go to, 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 to the hospital for an emergency, and that person needs months of very intensive medical care that will be very expensive. And the question for Ron Paul was, suppose this person doesn't have insurance, and they come to the hospital, he made a mistake, he should have bought insurance. Who, who pays for that person's uh, care? Or, 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 or what happens to him? And so, uh, and, and, and Ron Paul's position was, well, people, people the, the government shouldn't be responsible. Uh, and so as he said, who should take care of him? Should you just let him die? And this is a difficult question for a politician to answer, uh, but people in the audience shouted out, you could hear them on, on the tape saying, let him die, uh, is, 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 is what they said. Now, Ron Paul didn't want to say, let him die. Instead, what he said is, well, this person's family, this person's church should take care of him. What he didn't do was answer the next question, which is, and what if the family and the church can't take care of him? Then do you let him die? But he didn't want to go that far. Um, and this, 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 this illustrates sort of one side of not just the American political spectrum, but really the modern political spectrum. Uh, that is, we're not all in this together. That is you, individual responsibility. You take care of yourself, and if you make mistakes, you pay the consequences, and you reap the benefits if things go, if things go well, and if you make some bad choices with healthcare, then, then, then you die. Now, around the same time, there was a new political voice coming on to the, to the scene, and this is Senator Elizabeth Warren, uh, who is now the senator from my home state of Massachusetts. And she was just getting started. She was pretty much unknown at this time, or only known in academic circles. And she was at somebody's house, a very small gathering. Someone had a little camera that they were, they were, they were shooting her on, on video. And someone asked her, said, well, okay, so you, you're, you're one of these liberals, you think there should be more taxes, but isn't that taking away people's hard-earned money? Didn't they earn the, that, that money? Why should the government take it away and give it to other people? And she got very fired up. And, 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 and what she said ended up being, it was, it was captured on video and then it went viral on the web. Millions of people saw it and, and shared it and she said something like this. She said, look, you don't understand the way our society works. This is a big mistake. If you are a successful person, you have a successful business, that's great, and you should reap the benefits of your hard work. But there's something you need to understand, she said, that when you sold your goods at market, you move them on the roads that the rest of us paid for. And when you hired workers to work in your factory, you hired workers that the rest of us paid to educate. And when your factory was safe 
from fire because of the fire department. And your fa factory was safe from criminals because of the police. That safety that you take for granted, that was paid by all of us. So when you have your success and you enjoy your success, that's great. But there's something that you need to give back to the society so that the next generation has a chance to be as successful as you are. So people were, a lot of people really liked what Elizabeth Warren had to say. A lot of people really liked what Ron Paul had to say. And you have this divide between the people who say, look, we're all in this together, that we have this social contract that binds us together, and no one succeeds on their own. Everybody's success depends on the collective, and every, everybody owes something back to society. And then this other vision that says, no, we're primarily individuals, and if we have a collective, it's a smaller collective, the collective of the family, the collective of, of, of the church, but not the collective of this whole nation of 300 million different people. Now, I'm sure, I know, you have your own version of these questions, which really comes down to the question is, how big is your us? How much... Do, in, do people owe other people and how far out does it go? Do you only owe your family? Do you only owe the people who belong to your religion, people who belong to your city? Or do you only belong, owe, owe people who are a part of your nation? Or do you owe people who are part of the whole, all the people in the world? Or even perhaps animals uh, who, who might suffer uh, as, as a result of what we do to them to, to produce food? How big is your circle? Okay, so it's a very big question and it really is the central political question. Now, I'm a philosopher, I'm also a scientist, and I want to try to understand these things scientifically as well as philosophically. Now, it's a bit of a challenge to take that big question and turn it into something that you can study in the lab, but here's what, 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 what some of us do. So, we uh, use a little game which we call the public goods game, and it's sort of the simplest form of this question of, are you about me or are you about us? So, here's how it works. So, let's say four people come into the laboratory, and they're each given 10 American dollars. And they're given a simple choice. They say, you can keep all of your money, or you can put all of it or some of it into this common pool. Everything that goes into this common pool gets doubled by the experimenters. And then it gets divided equally among all four people. So what do you do? Well, if you do the math, you realize that if you're only doing this one time, and that's the way we, we, we do this, no matter what other people do, you come out with more money if you keep all of your money. So you keep your $10, maybe other people put in, it gets doubled, and then it gets divided equally. So you get your money that you kept plus your share of what other people put in and got doubled, right? If you want to do what's best for me, for myself, you keep all of your money. Now, if you want to do what's best overall for the group, you put all of your money in because that's what maximizes the amount that gets doubled and, and, and increases the total, as we say in English, I don't know if it's the same expression, enlarges the pie, makes the pie uh, as, 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 as big as possible. So we give people in the laboratory this choice, but we give it to them under different circumstances. So sometimes we just let them make the choice. Sometimes we say, you have to decide within 10 seconds. So you have to make a quick decision. And the idea here is to get people's more intuitive, fast response. Uh, and other times we say, you have to stop and think about this. You have to wait at least 10 seconds uh, to, you have to wait at least 10 seconds in order to give, 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 your, give your answer. So let me ask you, how many people think that people are going to be nicer, more cooperative, more us, when you make them go fast? Hands? Audience participation? No? Okay. How many people think that it'll, people will be nice, more us, if you make them stop and think about it? And how many people think no difference? Okay. So, so this is a good debate, right? We've got, we, 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 this is a, an open question about human nature, at least as it exists in different places. So I'll tell you what happened. When we made people go fast, uh, in, at least in our, our group of subjects in, 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 in Boston, they gave more money that it was a kind of intuitive response, right, that, that made them more, more cooperative. And when we made people go slow, they gave a little bit less. This is on average, not every single, single person. So interesting, right? So what, what's going on there? Well, one thing you might say is, aha, this means that people are innately good, right, that, that nature has made people good. I think there is a kind of reflex here. You might call it an instinct because it's a more automatic response. But I'm not sure, I don't think it's as simple as, oh, this is, just what we get from nature. So the, one of the things we did when we did these sorts of games is we asked people, how much do you trust the people that you interact with in your daily life? 
for the people who said, I trust the people who I interact with in my daily life, when they went fast, they gave more money. When they went slower, they gave less. So they really show that effect. It's the people who trust in general, it then spills over into this laboratory situation. For the people who said, I don't trust the people who I interact with in my daily life, those people, they didn't show any difference between fast and slow. And you could say it's like this. Their first thought is, I'm keeping my money. And their second thought is, I'm keeping my money. And as a result, it doesn't matter if you make them go fast or slow. They're keeping their money either way. Um, now, it turns out that I, I told you these results, but these are not universal results. And I'll, in, a, in a moment, I'll say a little bit more about how things change from, 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 from place to place. But at least we have this idea that sometimes people have an intuition, a feeling that makes them more cooperative. Right? Um, so a, a story that we sometimes tell you know, in, in, in the research world about this kind of situation, it, it, we call it the, the tragedy of the commons. How many people are familiar with the tragedy of the commons? Right? So this is Garrett Hardin, the famous ecologist who wrote this paper in 1968. So his version of the story goes like this. You have these herders who share this common pasture, and these are to begin, self-interested, rational herders. You know, they're from the economics department at Harvard University, uh, and they uh, and 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 they say, should I should I increase m my herd? Should I add more animals? And they think, well, if I have more animals, I make more money at market. That's good. Uh, what's the downside? Well, they're just on this common pasture, so it doesn't cost me much. So sure, I'll add more. And then they add more, and all the all the herders add more and more animals, and then suddenly. There's not enough grass for any of the animals. All the animals die, and everybody ends up worse off. And that's the tragedy of the commons, right? And that really is the basic problem of cooperation. And it comes up in healthcare. What do we owe each other? Do we collectively have to take care of that person who didn't buy health insurance, or say you must buy health insurance so that you're taken care of? Are you allowed to defend the sheep on your pasture with an assault weapon? This is uh, a, a big debate in the United States, uh, States right now, and I understand that you have questions about Social Security and how much should the government take care of people uh, in, in, w when they retire, and what should be done with all of the revenue that comes from Petrobras, from the oil that, 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 that has re recently been discovered. These all come down to these questions about how should the benefits and costs of living together be, be, be divided, and how much should it be on the individual, and how much should it be, be, be part of the group. Okay, so now I want to give you my sequel to uh, Hardin's Parable of the Commons. So imagine that you've got one group of herders, and they've decided they're going to be very collectivist. So they're going to be your communist herders, and what they say is, not only are we going to have a common pasture, we'll have a common herd. Everything's all for one and one for all. And then there's this, they're, they're on one side of this forest. And then on the other side of the forest is another group. And there you have your free market herders who say, no more common pasture. We're going to privatize the pasture, right? Uh, just like people talk about privatizing uh, pet, pet, Petrobras. Uh, you privatize the pasture. I have mine, you have yours. We, we respect each other's property rights, and that's how we, how, how we cooperate, right? And that's the way they do things. And it's different systems, and they can both be cooperative in their own way. And maybe these groups pray to different gods, and maybe these groups have different views about who's allowed to own sheep and who's allowed to live together and whether it's okay to be gay or okay to be transgender. These, do, these, these two tribes disagree, right? And then one hot, dry summer, there's a forest fire and the forest burns down and the rains come and now there's this nice pasture in the middle. And this tribe and this tribe, they look at the, for, the pasture and they say, oh, that's a very nice pasture. And they think, we'd like to move in, right? And the question is, What's going to happen when those two tribes meet, where they have different gods and different expectations about what life within the tribe is like and what people owe to each other? I think this is the modern moral problem. The basic moral problem is a problem of me versus us. It's the tragedy of the commons. It's the individual versus the group. The modern moral problem is us versus them. It's our interests versus their interests, or our system versus their system. Our gods and what they say versus their gods and what they say. And this is, I think, a fundamentally different kind of problem because the intuitions that we developed that help us solve the small problem don't necessarily help us solve the larger problem. And now I'm going to give you an example coming back to the tragedy of the commons and the public goods game. So I told you about the laboratory experiment where people come in and they get $10 and they can put it into the common pool. So some researchers have played this game 
in different cities around the world. This is work done by Benedict Herman and, 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 and colleagues. And they did a version of this where they didn't just have people play once, they had them play, say, 10 times in a row. And they added something else. After every round, when people put in their money or they keep their money and then you see what happens, players can punish other players. So you can say, I'll pay a dollar and then you, the experimenter, will take three dollars away from that guy. So let's say you put your money in and you're a good herder, you contribute to the group, and someone else says, hey, player number three, they didn't put anything in. So you can say, okay, I'll pay money to take money away from player number three. It's the economic version of hitting somebody on the head with a stick, right? Um, so what happens? Now what's interesting about this is it's the exact same game. It's the exact same set of opportunities in different cities around the world. And yet the results are very different. So in places like Copenhagen, and Boston is one of these places, St. Gallen in Switzerland is one of these places, right from the beginning people put almost all of their money in, they make more money together, and the next round they keep making more and more money, and they walk away with as much money or almost as much money as they could possibly make. And then there are other places like Athens uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and uh, Muscat uh, and Riyadh where people, uh, where, where, where people put money in, or people, very few people put money in, and, and, and it doesn't go very well. Actually, let me tell you about a third group. So there are places like Melbourne, Australia, and Seoul, South Korea, and Chengdu in China, where people start out putting some in, not as much as they could, and then the people who cooperate, they punish the people who didn't put money in, and as a result, more and more money goes in, and by the end, it looks like Copenhagen, right? Uh, now, back to Athens and Riyadh, people don't put a lot of money in at the beginning, and then it stays low. It never gets better. And the researchers looked and said, why, why, so why, why, don't, why doesn't it get better? Why don't the people who cooperated put more, you know, why don't they punish the people who didn't cooperate? And that way, you know, people, and, and, and what happened was they found that the punishment went both directions. That is, the people who co tried to cooperate, wanted everybody to cooperate and said, come on, I'm going to punish you if you don't cooperate. Well, they, they did that, but other people said, you're, you want to cooperate? I don't want to cooperate, and I'm going to pay to punish you for putting money in that's benefiting me. So this is called antisocial punishment is what they, what they call it. And they ask people afterwards, they say, so wait a second, you are paying money in order to take money away from people who are giving you money. And they said, yes. And they said, why would you do that? And they say, because I don't like this whole thing. The whole thing stinks. I don't know you, I don't know these people, I don't like your little communist game, I don't like any of this stuff, right? And it's kind of, I don't know what the equivalent here, but in, in the United States it would be the middle finger to, uh, to, 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 the, to the whole episode, right? Now, okay, so that's their, that, that's, the, that's their choice, that's what people tended to do in these places. But the thing is, I've been to Athens, I haven't been to the other cities, but I've been to Athens, the people there are very nice. If you've been to Athens, they're very nice. So what's going on? They're, they're these people who are, you know, if you just put a bunch of them together, they're doing this anti-social punishment, punishing people who, who are trying to help them. What's going on? And yet when you meet these people, they seem very nice. And this brings us back to this question of how big is your us? And what kind of circle of cooperation do you feel comfortable with? It's not that people in Copenhagen are nice and in Athens they're nasty. It's not that people are cooperative in Copenhagen and they're not cooperative in Athens. It's the circle is bigger or smaller, right? And what people feel comfortable with depends on who, 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 much more on who they're with. So in Copenhagen, they just say, well, you're a reasonable, rational person and I'm a reasonable, rational person and we will make money together and then they do, right? Whereas in Athens, it's, are you my friend? Are you my friend's friend? Are you my first cousin? Are you my second cousin? It's much smaller. And if you have a personal relationship, even just walking into somebody's store and you can begin that personal relationship, then you can have the beginning of cooperation. But when it's in this weird laboratory environment where everybody's in their separate cubicles and, no, and I'm just player number two and you're player number four and I don't know who anybody is and I don't know why they're doing this, people kind of freak out and they don't like it and they react against the whole thing. And now you could say, maybe you'd say neither is better than the other. In a sense, you know, maybe that's true. But certainly the people in Athens like having more money rather than less money. And they're getting less money as a result of their, of, 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 of the way they, they play this game. So this is an example of, I think, a way in which people can end up worse off as a result of a mismatch between the feelings that they have about cooperation 
and the, the circumstances, the environment they find them in. And some cultures have done a pretty good job of figuring out how can we all be happy together right from the start. And others are still struggling with that problem. And it's not to say that, you know, again, that the people are better or worse. But there may be better or worse systems. And there may be better or worse feelings for getting along in the modern world. So then one question is, okay, is there, so what's the best way, right? So one natural thought, so go back to our, the tra what I call the tragedy of common sense morality. This is, we have this tribe here and this tribe here and they're trying to live together. And I call it the co tragedy of common sense morality because it's not just that they have different values and different interests, but they feel it in their gut, that it's, it's intuitive to them. Of course, we all work together here in the communist tribe. Of course, we all take care of ourselves and we're independent in, in, in the free market tribe, right? It's not just a matter of, a disagreement. It's a question of their feeling about what's the right way to organize a society. So if we're going to step back and we're going to say, okay, but in the modern world where we're all these different tribes trying to live together under these weird new modern circumstances, what's the best way? Is, is one tribe right and the other tribe's wrong? Or is there something like what I would call a meta-morality? That is, a basic morality is what exists within a tribe, and what we need in the modern world is something like a meta-morality. That is, a basic morality takes otherwise self-interested individuals and helps them form a group. And then a meta-morality would be, takes otherwise tribal tribes and helps them form a larger group that maybe is, 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 is the whole world. But what would a meta-morality look like? So one answer to this question comes from a philosophy that some people like and a lot of, a lot of people don't, which has a terrible name. It's known as utilitarianism. And what utilitarianism says is the best thing to do is what promotes greatest happiness overall. Whatever system would make the herders of the world as happy as possible overall, that's the best kind of system. And I actually think that's a pretty good answer. But there are some serious problems with this answer that says always do what's going to pr pr produce the greatest good. And I'll give you a, a, a famous and perhaps familiar example of this. So how many of you have heard of trolley dilemmas? Okay, a couple, but, but this is usually, okay, I'm glad I have an audience of trolley, mostly trolley virgins. Uh, so, uh, so, the, 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 so here's the situation. The trolley, is a, there's a runaway trolley that's, that, 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 that's lost its brakes and there are five people on the tracks. It's okay that they're there, they're supposed to be there, but they don't know the trolley is coming and, and if, if, if you don't do anything, those people are going to be killed. But you see what's going on and you can hit a switch that will turn the trolley onto a sidetrack. But there's one person on the sidetrack. So if you do nothing, it'll run over the five, but if you hit the switch, you can turn it, it'll run over one. How many people think it's okay to hit the switch so that five people live instead of, and, and, and one person die instead of five people die? Hands? How many think that's okay? How many people think it's not okay? Okay, a couple no, few yes, a lot of people shy, that's all right. Um, I'll give you a, 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 a companion case that goes with this. The trolley is now headed towards five people, but this time you're on a footbridge over the tracks and there's a big person standing next to you. And the only way to save those five people is to push the big person with a big backpack off the footbridge, he lands on the tracks, gets killed by the train, but it stops the, fi it stops the trolley from hitting the five people. Now, I know you're all very smart, and a lot of you are already trying to think your way out of this dilemma. You say, wait a second, why can't you jump yourself? You can't jump yourself because I said so. I, I'm writing the dilemma. You've all been to the movies. You know how to suspend disbelief, and I'm asking you to suspend disbelief. Another thing you might say is, is this going to work? I mean, have you ever tried to stop a trolley with a person wearing a backpack? It's going to work. Even if you just make those assumptions, no, you can't jump yourself. Yes, it's going to work. You've been to the movies. You know how to do this. Uh, how many of you think it's okay to push the guy off the footbridge in order to save the fire. Okay, so a couple hands. How many people think it's not okay? All right. Uh, um, how many people are, are uncomfortable, not sure? Okay, right. So let me tell you a little bit. So, 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 so this footbridge kind of case is a classic argument against utilitarianism. And you can hear the voice of Immanuel Kant saying, you cannot treat humanity as a means. You must only treat humanity or as, as a means only. You can't use a human as a trolley stopper, right? 
uh, and that's and 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 that's wrong. And even if it's going to promote the greater good, that's wrong. And this is one of many examples along these lines where there are certain things that are just wrong to do, even if they're going to promote the greater good. And this is one objection to this idea that we should do whatever is going to make things go as well as possible. And this is actually where my research began with this trolley problem. So we've probably been going on for a long time, but. Yeah, how, how long have I been talking for? Uh, <laughs> 20, minutes. 20 minutes, okay. Well, I could leave it at that or I could do a little trolley science. What would you like me to do? Yeah, I, I would like you to suggest some, pos some possible answers to the trolley oh, okay. problem and yeah. then we can discuss and have yeah. them to make some questions. Here. Okay, well, so let me give you, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, the scientific version of possible answers. So one, one response to this, so let me tell you, give you a little background on the science. So. We now know, and this was sort of my hypothesis originally, uh, which we first tested with brain imaging, putting people in the brain scanner and looking at what's going on in their brains when they're thinking about these things. But we, we now know from a lot of different kinds of research that when people think about a case like the Footbridge case, you have an emotional response that makes you say, no, don't push the guy off the footbridge. And you can see this in a part of your brain called the amygdala, which is the same part of your brain that would react if you were to see a snake or something like that. Um, and then that, the amygdala sends a signal to a part of your brain called the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, which takes this signal and weighs it against the other consideration, which is says, well, wait, five lies versus one, doesn't it make sense? And those things fight it out here. If you look at people who have damage to this part of the brain, which is essential for putting those emotional signals together, those people are much more likely to say that it's okay to push the guy off the footbridge. And in other cases, they're five times more likely to say that it's okay to hurt somebody to save other, other people's lives. Now, if you look at, you say, well, what is it about the Footbridge case that makes people say that it, it's wrong to do it? We can play around with that as well. So I, we can give people a version where instead of pushing the guy off the Footbridge, you hit a switch and it'll drop the guy through a trap door onto the tracks. Now, most people say that it's okay if you do it separately, right? So it's, and, and so it's something about pushing as opposed to uh, hitting a switch. So one response, and then we'll, I probably I'll wrap up, is to say, you know what? It's good that we have feelings that make us not want to push people off of footbridges because violence is a bad thing, right? And so we have these feelings that we learn from when we were two years old, don't push people around, right? Don't hurt people with your pushing, and we have that feeling. And then a fiendish philosopher comes along and says, wait, I'm going to make an example so that this thing that has felt bad to you since you were two now is guaranteed to promote the greater good. And then I'm going to say, do you like it now? And then you say no, because you still have the feeling, right? And, and it's good that you have that feeling, just not in this case, because now five people are going to die instead of one, right? So one response to this is to say, you know what? The problem isn't with utilitarianism, or as I prefer to call it, deep pragmatism. We can talk more about that. The problem isn't with the idea of trying to make the world as happy as possible. The problem is that our feelings are kind of inflexible, that it's generally good to not want to commit acts of violence, but there may be cases where causing some kind of physical harm, perhaps this is true for abortion or physician-assisted suicide, uh, where, where our feelings can get in the way of doing what actually promotes the greater good. So my view is that I think we can make progress on these larger questions by having a philosophy, but we have to think about the psychology behind the philosophy and behind the objections to that philosophy. And so I'll sort of leave it as an open question. Can a science of understanding how we think about moral problems help us make moral progress? I'll leave you with, with, with that question and looking forward to our conversation. Well, thank you very much, Professor Green. I would ask you now to wear this in order to understand my questions. <laughs> thank you very much. Bon. I would say some very irrelevant stuff for you right now. <laughs> so, bon, I queria, uh, in nome do Fronteiras do Pensamento e do Centro Ruth Cardoso, agradecer imensamente a fala do Professor uh, Joshua Green. O livro, como vocês podem ver, é de veras interessante. Uh, conjunto de experimentos, para quem é da área de humanidades e filosofia, por exemplo, conjunto de experimentos, de dados empíricos que o livro mobiliza é fantástico, para quem é dessa área vai ver todo o seu trabalho e a sua área de pesquisa associada também à reflexão filosófica. E eu, portanto, gostaria de começar pedindo uh, ao professor Green que 
explicasse um pouco melhor para a gente de que modo é, estes é, casos que foram apresentados aqui, seja os exemplos políticos americanos que nós também conseguimos conectar com algumas das realidades brasileiras, né? o exemplo do Ron Paul e de um ultralibertarianismo uh, individualista contra qualquer tipo de intervenção do Estado ou de arranjo coletivista de sociedade, seja o exemplo oposto, né, de uma organização da sociedade que pense coletivamente o bem dos indivíduos, até os exemplos de laboratório, né, é, os exemplos de pesquisa, de experimentos, como isso encontra um fundamento nisso que nós chamamos de psicologia evolucionista? Como isso está associado à evolução? Qual é a contribuição que a evolução e a antropologia e as ciências uh, que lidam com esses temas têm dado para que você possa fazer as suas pesquisas? Como entra o elemento da evolução aí? Well, thank you. That's a very big question. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me. So, so I think you know. One of the most basic facts about human nature is that I think we have a very strong tendency to be tribalistic. That is to think that, you know, me and my friends and my group and the people in my religion, people in my country, they're, it, that's the most important thing. And my obligation, what makes me a good person, is that I take care of the people who are close to me, who are within my circle, who are, who are, who are within my tribe. Now, what happens when you combine that basic human attitude, which may have helped us spread our genes in the past, right? I mean, you can imagine if there were two types of tribes, imagine there's one tribe that says, I care about my tribe and not so much about every, but anybody else, and another tribe that said, we love the whole world and we don't want to harm anybody. Which tribe do you think is going to be more successful in war? Which, which, which tribe is going to, 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 to put more of its genes in the next uh, generation? So there's a perfectly good biological explanation for why we would be tribalistic. Um, and even to the extent that we are kind, generous, empathetic, all of that stuff evolved, at least this is our best explanation for it, as a weapon. Teamwork is an effective weapon, right? That you don't, that you don't spread your genes by, uh, you, it, only, it only pays to be nice if your niceness produces teamwork, cooperative benefits that then enable you to outcompete other people, right? So that the actual, the, the, the best explanation that we have for why humans are nice is that humans are nasty. That is, humans are nice within group so that together they can be nasty or at least outcompete uh, 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 other groups. Now, I want to say, so I don't think that that means that we are stuck with that, and I'll give an example of, 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 of that in a moment, that just because that's where our, how our niceness evolved doesn't mean that it has to be limited in that way. But you asked for a specific application. So what happens when you take basic human tribal psychology and combine it with nuclear weapons? Right, so take what's going on right now between the United States and, 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 and North Korea. If all the humans say, what matters most of all is my group's security. Sure, I don't want your people to die. That would be too bad. But the most important thing is America first or North Korea first, right? Or China first or whatever it is. How long can we go on with weapons that are, uh, that are powerful enough to destroy all of humanity if everybody is free to have the attitude, my group's uh, well-being and survival is the most important thing and everything else comes second, right? I mean, that's, I think, is the most basic example. So n coming back to this question of, well, if our niceness evolved for nastiness, for competition, does that mean that we're stuck? Does that mean that we are hardwired forever to be tribalistic and to be fighting as, as groups? I don't think that that's necessarily the case. And let me, let me give you an example. We were actually just talking about this before uh, uh, the, the, the start of the event today. Um, take the example of birth control, right? So humans, like to have sex. Why do humans like to have sex? Well, evolution was very clever. Evolution promotes you know, in, in individuals that spread their genes, and that's, how, that's the thing you have to do in order to get your genes into the next generation. So it made sex something that people enjoy, right? Um, people don't enjoy taking care of lots and lots of children, but you know, evolution is not trying to make you happy. It's trying to make you have more of, of your genetic material in the next generation, right? Um, <laughs> Now, humans also have big 
fancy brains that can solve complicated problems. Now, why do we have that? Well, that's a very useful thing to have. If you're the kind of primate that can figure out how to make complicated traps and spears and other weapons that can help you hunt animals or defeat the tribe next door, that's a good thing to have. So now we're humans who like to have sex, who don't enjoy having the maximum number of babies, and we have big brains that allow us to solve complicated problems. Put all those things together, bake for a few hundred years, a couple thousand years, and you get something like birth control, where now you have clever humans have invented a technology that allows humans to have sex without having babies. Now, from evolution's point of view, this is a terrible disaster. But tough for evolution, right? Uh, we can say just because, just because these feelings evolved to serve a certain purpose doesn't mean that we have to embrace that purpose, right? Just because what, our, what evolution is trying to get us to do, and I'm anthropomorphizing a bit, is to get us to make as many babies as possible, we don't have to say those are our values. We can say, you know what, we're going to use our big primate brains to invent things like birth control so that we can have the kinds of lives that we want with some children, but not too many children from our point of view, and that's okay. And I think that what we, there's no reason to assume that we can't do something different, but in, a, in an abstract way, analogous with our morality. That is, just as birth control allows us to get free from the biological imperative of making more and more babies, our morality, our brains can enable us to get free of the basic tribal imperative of my group at the expense of yours. We don't have to go on doing, doing that for the rest of time. And in fact, if we don't figure out how to be less tribalistic, then you know, if the nuclear weapons don't kill us, then, 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 then perhaps the biological weapons will, or, 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 or a, a, a other things. So uh, sorry for the long answer, but that, I think that, that's at least how I see the, the, this, 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 at least one way these sort of thoughts can be applied. I think the next one will be longer. Oh boy, all right. I'll Vejamos. No, uh, professor, uh, I will ask you again oh, to yeah. put, okay. okay. <coughs> no. Muito obrigado, professor Green. Uh, enquanto vocês perdem um pouco da timidez, professor Vinícius, Evandro, enquanto vocês se preparam para fazer as perguntas, todos vocês na audiência, é, eu vou tentar fazer mais uma formulação de uma questão que vai na mesma direção, professor, que é a seguinte, é, como o senhor reagiria a uma abordagem um pouco diferente da questão que sugerisse o seguinte, de um lado, isso que o senhor está descrevendo como a evolução e que teria... Um, preparado nos seres humanos um maquinário moral, a moral machinery, como o senhor diz no livro, digamos que isso seja apenas natureza, não vamos falar em evolução, vamos falar apenas em natureza. E vamos dizer que, de repente, depois que o trabalho realizado pela natureza está razoavelmente adequado, nós sobrevivemos, nós não somos mais uh, reféns de tigres, onças, leões, o que quer que seja, chuvas, intempéries, um belo dia um sujeito grego, em Atenas, é, pergunta para outro sujeito grego, em Atenas, o seguinte, o que você acha melhor moralmente? Qual é a coisa certa moralmente a fazer? É melhor sofrer uma injustiça ou praticar uma injustiça? Esta é a questão que muitos historiadores da filosofia localizam lá num diálogo de Platão, que é a, a, a pergunta que funda a moral no Ocidente, que funda a disciplina moral no Ocidente. Como esta pergunta poderia ser respondida ou compreendida em termos da psicologia evolucionista, da abordagem que o senhor favorece? So it's interesting. Let me make sure I sort of understand the spirit in which the, the, the question is asked. So before we get to utilitarianism and John Stuart Mill, and, uh, in the earliest days of Western philosophy, you have Aristotle and Plato and, and, and others uh, with, theory, with, with ideas that are sort of less systematic in some sense, but getting at this core question of me versus us. That is, if there's going to be a transgression, is it better for you to be on the winning end or the losing end of it? Is that, a, 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 and, 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 and the thought is that that gets at the... In some sense, yes. uh, can I yeah, ask yeah, you to yeah, yeah. 
I'm, right. I'm sorry about that. No, no, no. no. Só para esclarecer então um pouco a questão. Como é que isso aparece na filosofia para os gregos que dão o, o pontapé inicial para essa disciplina que nós chamamos de moral, de ética? É. Tá? Uh, toda a argumentação de Sócrates, que na verdade é apenas um personagem de é. Platão, tá? não esquece a figura histórica, consiste em dizer o seguinte, o seu senso comum vai ser que praticar uma injustiça é melhor do que sofrer. Eu não, quero que, eu não quero que pratiquem injustiças contra mim. Eu prefiro, nessa história, eu prefiro praticar uma injustiça. É assim que os interlocutores de Sócrates respondem no diálogo platônico. E o que Platão, Sócrates e Aristóteles fazem? Sorry about that. Negativo. Moralmente falando, se você é um agente moral, se você tem realmente caráter... Uhum você vai preferir sofrer uma injustiça a praticar uma injustiça. Praticar uma injustiça é a coisa mais torpe, mais vil, mais baixa que você pode fazer. Ela é degradante para o seu caráter. Portanto, você não vai querer praticar uma injustiça jamais. Só que isso parece não contribuir em nada. Nem para a evolução, nem para o convívio do grupo, nem para a cooperação. Como, a, como os temas da cooperação e da evolução entrariam nesta que parece ser a Primeira e mais importante pergunta da filosofia moral. Uh, okay, I think I understand uh, better now. So the question is, if we evolve to spread our genes, right? Uh, where does this philosophy come from that says it's better to 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 be hurt than to hurt, right? Okay, so I I, I think that uh, th this the answer lies in again this idea that we are evolved for teamwork, right? So let's think of it this way. If you were on, if, if, if you were on a, a, a you, were, you were dropped into some wilderness with, with, with a bunch of other people, right? And you know, some, most of them were set already, but you could choose between person A and person B, right? Would you want somebody who, if it had to choose, would rather victimize someone than be victimized? Or would you rather be, on, be, be dropped there with someone who's more worried about hurting people than being hurt? How many people would rather be there with the person who's, uh, mo who's more worried about getting hurt? How many people would rather be there with the person who's more worried about hurting others? Right? Hmm? No? Is no one's answer? Okay. From my point of view, maybe you'll uh, uh, agree, we want friends, we want partners who are... You know, we're already fairly biased in our self-interest in a lot of ways. It's easy for us to ignore other people's pain and focus on our own, right? So if someone has a, 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 a corrective tendency to put more value on others than themselves, that's a good team member, right? And now, imagine two groups. And now, the, I, what I didn't tell you is you've got the group in the wilderness that was dropped there, and those, that group has consists of people who are more worried about hurting the other people on their teams than they are about being hurt by them. And on the other side are some people uh, who, who, who were dropped into the wilderness, and they're more worried about being hurt by other people on their, in their group than they are about hurting others. Who do you think is going to survive better, right? I think the, the, the group where people are concerned about the well-being of others They're going to share the food when, when, when food is scarce, and they're going to survive. They're going to warn the others when there's, when, 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 there's, when, there's, when there's an attack. When someone's injured, they're the ones who are going to carry that person on their back to safety, right? So in a world in which if you are species like sharks, where they don't, they're not really social, they don't really interact, then the nastiest, greediest, biggest, most selfish shark is the shark that's going to survive better. But for a social species that survives through cooperation, niceness is an advantage because niceness means you can be part of a team and teams win. Does that make, make sense? Yeah. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, não, não apenas, uh, obrigado, não apenas faz sentido como é uma grande resposta no sentido da, no campo da, da experiência da psicologia evolucionista, mas eu vou, eu vou me me abstei de fazer mais perguntas que uh, arremessem o senhor de volta para o mundo grego antigo e voltar para suas experiências de laboratório e para suas pesquisas okay. contemporâneas para a gente poder continuar na discussão. E eu gostaria de mais uma vez insistir que as perguntas estão abertas, as pessoas podem uh, apenas fazer o gesto de levantar a mão, que a gente dá um jeito de fazer, né? Carol, passa o microfone, alguma coisa assim? 
Perfeito. Ah, esse tem um aqui, exatamente. Obrigado. Então, ou então, quem quiser mandar perguntas por escrito aqui, a gente vai, também vai preparando. É, bom, então, enquanto isso, eu vou fazer mais uma pergunta para o senhor, professor, é, que consiste só para impedir para o senhor explicar um pouco melhor a diferença entre o pensamento rápido na tomada de decisão versus o pensamento mais lento, mais demorado, que foi objeto de pesquisa de um grande economista, psicólogo, vencedor do Prêmio Nobel de Economia, Daniel Kahneman, que também, quem quiser, vai no portal do fronteiras.com, tem um grande vídeo que nós gravamos com ele lá. Então, se o senhor puder explicar como esse conceito foi importante para o desenvolvimento da sua pesquisa e do seu livro, por gentileza. Oh, ok. Thank you. It's a great question. And, and, uh, and uh, yeah, so Kahneman and, and his research partner... Uh, you should take this person. off, because oh, otherwise you'll be hearing point. her in Portuguese. Yeah. <laughs> Got to keep, <laughs> well, keep it straight. Uh, so, no, so, so the work of Kahneman and Tversky uh, was enormously influential. I mean, you could think of really of all of my research in moral psychology has really been applying their general framework specifically to questions about uh, about morality so um, you know to, to take an, an, an ex a famous example from 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 Kahneman uh, if you he did, did an experiment uh, where you, you this was at a, a, a university uh, in the United States there was a room full of students and half of the students were given coffee mugs and they were told you know these are your your, your, your coffee mugs um, but we'd be willing to buy them back from you how much would we have to pay you for you to be willing to give up your coffee mug? Um, and they write down you know, the, the, the number that they would accept. Other students were said, look at that person's coffee mug. You could have a coffee mug like that. How much money would we have to give you such that you would prefer having the money to having the mug? Um, and they write down their answer. Now, if you think about it, those two groups faced exactly the same choice. They could have money or they could have mug, and it's just a question of how much money is the mug work. But it turns out they gave very different answers. The, the students who were told, this is your mug, you have it in your hands right now, how much do I have to pay you for you to give it up? They wanted almost twice as much money to give up their mug as the other group wanted so, such that they could you know, just have the money instead of having the mug. The outcome is exactly the same. So I mean, there's a, a classic example of thinking fast versus thinking slow. Now, why would we have that feeling? Well, I mean, this is one story, but uh, you know, there, there are things that we have, and if you have something already, it may already be very important to you. The things that you don't have are not necessarily, are less likely to be things that you need because you've survived this long without them, right? Um, so it, it makes a certain kind of sense for us to have feelings of attachment to the things that we already have, right? Now, uh, and and and. That's at least a part of an explanation of why you would place more value on something simply simply because you're told that it that, that it's yours as opposed to this thing that's just out there uh, that 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 you, that that you could have. That's a kind of fast response. I own it. It's mine, and now I've it has a little sparkle on it because it's mine, right? And I, I want to keep it. But you're also capable of thinking about it slow. You can say it's the same mug, <laughs> it's the same money. What I care about is 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 whether I walk out with money or mug, and you know, not about whether or not I was told that I owned it beforehand, right? And that sort of thinking through the situation, saying, what do I actually care about? The microphone, sorry. Uh, oh, well, what, what do I actually care about? You know, what, what are my goals, and which options get me to my goals, right? That, that's the, that, that, that's the alternative in this case. And to, you know, to, to go back to the trolley case, I think it's something similar, right? That is, just as we naturally have a positive feeling about something that we already own, we naturally have a negative feeling about committing an act of violence, which is, it's a good thing for us to have that feeling. But then you can also think through the situation and say, well, why, do I, why, is, it, why is violence bad? Violence is bad because it hurts people, right? Well, now we're talking about a situation where you can end up with one person hurt or five people hurt. Which is better, one person hurt or five people hurt, right? And you think it through in the same kind of slow, explicit sort of way. So I think it's the same phenomenon. It's feelings that are attached to specific objects or specific actions in a way that might make sense in general, but not in any, not always in every case. And then the ability to actually think, well, in a broader sense, what outcomes do I really want, and which choice is going to get me to outcomes that I consider overall better? Vamos permitir fazer, obrigado, professor. 
Eu vou me permitir fazer uma pergunta a partir dessa sua consideração do trolley problem e de como esse problema do carrinho de você jogar ou não empurrar lá ou não a pessoa para morre um você salva cinco versus né? um que é inocente não tem nada a ver com a história não tem nada né? e eu vou me permitir reformular isso de uma outra forma veja se eu estou correto por favor se a pergunta não fizer sentido a gente passa para melhores da audiência a pergunta é a seguinte um indivíduo inocente ele não tem absolutamente nada de criminoso, de perigoso, etc, etc. Ele simplesmente é an innocent standby, ele é um inocente. No entanto, se eu torturá-lo, se eu praticar a tortura, uhum. ele pode me revelar informações a respeito de um atentado terrorista. E, portanto, se eu, uhum. de fato, obter essas informações, eu evito um atentado terrorista. Ao evitar o atentado terrorista, eu salvo muitas pessoas, milhares de pessoas, talvez milhões de pessoas. Esta é uma versão um pouquinho menos fantasiosa do trolley problem. No entanto, os elementos morais me parecem ser os mesmos. Eu devo fazer isso ou não devo fazer isso? Uma maneira de você responder é a maneira da psicologia evolucionista somada ao utilitarismo que o senhor defende, que é dizer o seguinte, olha, se você pensar mais devagar, você vai ver que não tem outra alternativa a não ser tortura, obtém informação e salva milhões de pessoas. Outra maneira de pensar isso, é uma maneira um pouco acovardada, mas é o seguinte, esta é uma decisão trágica e moralmente não existe coisa certa a fazer. Como o senhor encara essa situação? É o mesmo que o trolley problem? Não é o mesmo que o trolley problem? Tem algum elemento aqui que está faltando? Ou não há, não, não, há, não há tragédia e simplesmente é como nós fazemos para sobreviver e preservar os nossos genes? So I, I think you're absolutely right that, that, that uh, I think you're absolutely right that it, it is, it, 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 I mean, there are important details that are different, but it has the same structure as the, as, as, as the trolley problem. In some ways, I think it's, it's, it's a less difficult dilemma. That is, it's easier to say, torture one person to save a million lives than it is to say kill one person to save f five people. I actually feel more comfortable with that, even though I don't feel comfortable with either. But I don't think that taking the utilitarian perspective doesn't mean saying that it's not a tragedy. It's a tragedy because you're in a situation where something terrible has to happen either way. And the question is, which of those terrible things do you want to have happen? <laughs> But to say that, uh, To, to, to say that just because it's tragic, you know, one, one response is to say, well, they're just both wrong, and that's all there is to mm -hmm. say about it. But I don't think, I mean, I agree that they both feel wrong. That is, they both feel very, like, very bad things to do. But I think it would be a mistake to say that we have no more reason to do one thing rather than another, right? I mean, so, so imagine the case... Take, take a, a, a version of the trolley case where you can, there's a, the trolley is headed, let's say, it's, it's headed towards a dam. There's a tr tracks over this dam that's holding back all this water, and there's explosives on the dam. Someone left them there. And if the, if, 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 if the trolley goes over the tracks, then it, it, the dam will explode and a million people will die, right? Or you can turn the trolley onto a side track where it will run over one person. Maybe you can say it'll run over one dog, right? It's a terrible thing to have to kill a person or even to have to kill a dog. But I think it would be a much bigger mistake to say that the life of a person or even the life of a dog is equal to the life of a million people in a, in, in, in a city. So I, I, I think what these cases nicely illustrate is that you know, we can have very strong competing feelings, but the, the, the modern challenge is to figure out what makes the most sense to do when we have these conflicting feelings. And these can be feelings that conflict within ourselves or feelings that conflict between groups, where one group feels very strongly that A is right and B is wrong, and another group feels the opposite. So I guess I would say it is tragic, but we still have to choose, and I, and I think it doesn't make sense to choose randomly. I think that we can have, have a moral philosophy that, that, that gives us a, a principled basis for choosing, even if nothing we can choose feels good. A moral philosophy? Mm -hmm that gives us principles to choose torture? Would you agree with that? In very unusual, extreme circumstances, yes. 
Uh, this is sort of a yeah. uh, 24-hour yeah, situation, right? Right. right. <laughs> uh, a mini-série, aquela vocês devem lembrar. Uh, bom, mas enfim, uh, I would ask you to put again the, 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 the phone. So, eu gostaria de fazer agora alguma pergunta do público que chegou aqui e que é muito interessante, uh, do Ebrahim Andrade, do Instituto Jatobão, que é a seguinte. Como a psicologia da evolução entende... Sorry. Sorry. Is this okay for you? Como a psicologia da evolução entende o altruísmo? How does evolutionary psychology understands uh, altruism? Right. So, coming back to some of the things we talked about earlier, uh, um, uh, I think that you know, so you can define altruism in a technical sense as being willing to pay a cost in order to benefit another person, right? And there are a few different ways where you can explain how altruism can come to exist uh, purely with an evolutionary framework. So one is what's known as kin selection. So this is if you have individuals who are willing to be nice to, to help, to be altruistic towards people who share their genes, so family, then from the genes point of view, this is actually helping those genes spread because you are protecting and, pr and, 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 and helping the same genes just in a, different, in, a, in a different body, right? When you get outside of people who are genetically related, the, basic, the most basic mechanism is reciprocity. That is, I can pay a cost to benefit you, and if the, what I pay as a cost is is smaller than the benefit that you get, right? So let's say you're drowning in a, in a, in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a river, and I can reach in and, and 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 get you. And yes, you know, I'll take some risk to myself, but chances are I'll be fine, and I can save you. It's a little cost for me, big benefit for you. If the next time you can pull me out of the river, right? Now we're both we're we're both much better off, right? So this is called reciprocal altruism, and you know what I described there is a one-on-one, -on -one, you know. I help you, you help me. There's a debate about how it works in larger groups where it's not necessarily the same people helping other people and whether or not having rules and having punishment can, can, can make it so that everybody's involved in this kind of reciprocal benefit. But the basic story is that either you're related to people and therefore when you help them, you're really helping your own genes or you are engaged in a repeated set of encounters like within a tribe, within a relationship, where I can help you and you can help me and, and, and ends up making us both do better in the long run if we're willing to, at certain times, pay, pay a cost for, 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 for others. So that's the basic evolutionary story about where altruism can, can, can come from. There are more complicated variations on this, but those are the sort of two core mechanisms. Obrigado. É, essa questão também uh, abrange uma outra pergunta que foi feita sobre a relação de custos e benefícios no cálculo. Eu gostaria de já deixar mencionado. E tinha uma pergunta do auditório agora aqui. Duas perguntas. Quem é que está com o microfone? Esse aqui? Obrigado. Em português ou em inglês? Sim, sim, sim. Eu faço a pergunta em português ou em inglês? Em português, para ela poder traduzir. Em português, para ela poder traduzir. É, eu queria saber, é, com relação aos estudos de, é, que o senhor menciona, é, principalmente no... no é, me pareceu que é, essas decisões elas não são racionais. Eu acho que até tomando com o princípio... Elas não são 100% racionais, elas podem ser parcialmente eh, racionais, mais ou menos, mas elas nunca são 100% racionais. E todas as premissas de estudos econômicos partem do princípio de que as decisões são racionais. É, a partir daí, tem-se tentado fazer eh, estudos... Uh, refazer estudos e projeções econômicas levando em conta uh, essa nova maneira de pensar, essa não racionalidade da tomada de decisão. A minha pergunta é se o senhor acha possível uh, criar modelos, uh, talvez até usando tecnologia, dada a diversidade dessas possibilidades, né? porque abre um 
horizonte de possibilidades muito amplo, né? praticamente infinito. Great. Oh, thank you. It's a very excellent question. Um, I, this is this is essentially what people in my field are trying to do. That is, we know that people are not perfectly selfish, and we know that people, even when they have selfish goals, they don't pursue those goals in a perfectly rational way, right? And so the question is, how how can you have if 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 the most simple theories of human behavior like people are totally selfish and perfectly rational, right? Or people are completely unselfish, right? Or completely irrational. If we're in between, where there's something rational about our behavior, but it's not perfectly rational, and we're not completely selfish, but we're not completely altruistic, how, how do you make sense of those trade-offs, right? And this is exactly what we in this field are trying to do. That is, we're trying, and, and, and I think, and it's the same framework as Kahneman and Tversky. That is to say, if you want to understand people's behavior, you really have to understand different parts of the mind. You have to understand what intuitions do people have, and then the deeper question is, where do those intuitions come from, right? How are they learned from experience, or how are they spread culturally, or how do they come directly from biology, if that's true in some cases? And then, we have uh, people's ability to think, oh, people's ability to think uh, in a more you know, uh, explicit kind of cost-benefit reasoning or you know, means and this is my goal and this is how I get there kind of way. And all of those things come together to produce the complicated sort of behavior that, that, that people, that, that, that people ex ex exhibit. And I think that, but because there isn't a sort of single simple theory that accounts for everything all people, all cultures at the same time. A good example, maybe a good way to think about it is by analogy to language, right? So uh, you, know, you might say, you know, are, are there principles that govern language? You might say, well, no, there's no one set of principles that govern language. Someone who's Chinese or someone who speaks uh, Portuguese or speaks English, they can't even understand each other. It's completely different. Now, every, every language is a world unto itself, right? And then along came Noam Chomsky and he said, well, it's true that there are a lot of important differences, but if you look deeper under all of these things, there are some basic structures that are the same across all languages. And then there are certain settings that can vary. You know, some languages have the, the subject comes before the verb and some have the verb comes before the subject, so those are different things that can change. And then there are certain aspects that are completely arbitrary, where this sound is associated with this meaning and this other sound is associated with that meaning. And I think morality is going to be a similar thing. That is, there are some, there's some complicated underlying structure, you know, me versus us versus them, right? But then there are parameters that have to be set, you know, ab ab about how selfish within group, how selfish bet bet between groups, what are relations like between men and women or parents and children. And then there are some things that are completely arbitrary, like this group rests on the Friday, but the other group rests on, 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 on Saturday, where there's no deeper explanation, it's just arbitrary. And that, you know, I, that's not an answer, but it's a, a structure for filling in the details of what a more complete answer would look like. Mais uma, Carol, por gentileza, então ainda da plateia. Evandro, por favor. Ah, não, você. Professor. Professor, é, como que a psicologia experimental e essas coisas evolucionárias podem ajudar a gente a escolher entre essas teorias que estão competindo, com teorias morais que estão competindo? Se você quiser deixar mais concreto para ajudar a responder... É, como a psicologia experimental pode te ajudar a resolver o problema, a responder o problema do bond, né, do trolley? Great, great. So I, I think where psychology can be most helpful is when it reveals patterns in our judgment, in our behavior, that when we understand what's going on, they don't make sense to us. Right, so I gave you one example that's like this. So when, when, I, when I said, okay, if you say, is it okay to push the guy off the footbridge? Most people say no. And then I told you about the case where I said, well, suppose you can hit a switch that will drop the guy through the trap door onto the tracks. And now most people say yes. And some of you laughed when I said that, right? What does that laugh mean? 
what that laugh means is that you can look at this aspect of your own mind and go, that's silly. That doesn't really make sense, right? That I feel like it's wrong to push the guy off the footbridge. And I feel like it's less wrong or maybe okay to hit a switch that will kill the guy if it will save five people. But when I put those two things together, I think that can't be what matters. Whether or not these people should live and these people should die or vice versa, that can't depend on whether I'm pushing with my hands or hitting a switch. If you had a friend who said, called you from a footbridge and said, please help, I'm going to have to make a difficult choice. I can kill one person to save five people. Should I do it? You wouldn't say, ah, well, that depends. Will you be using a switch or will you be pushing with your hands, right? So, you know, we laugh at our, at our own psychology, right? And it's those moments where we can say, yes, I see this pattern in my behavior, but it doesn't really make sense. That's what gives us the purchase to say, right? Now, someone could say, like John Stuart Mill does, it's better to promote the greater good overall. And someone else can say, no, it's not. Because if that were true, it would be wrong. It would be OK to push the guy off the footbridge. And now we have a, another response was to say, well, maybe it is OK to push the guy off the footbridge if you really accept all of the specifics of that situation. And what's happening is we just have feelings about pushing versus hitting a switch that we laugh at when we understand them, right? Now that's one little piece, right? But I think that a, what we're going to un, see more generally, and we're starting to, is that the feelings that, that we have that make us say it's wrong to promote the greater good, those are feelings that make sense, that serve a general purpose, but they're not very flexible, that they work in general, but not in every situation, especially the crazy situations that philosophers come up with to try to understand their, 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 their theories. So, you know, I think moral progress through science is long and slow, but I think that the, the laughing that we do at our own thinking is, is, it reflects a kind of process where we can look at something that we've done and say that doesn't really make sense, and whatever it is, we should be doing something else. Thank you very much, professor. Eu gostaria de agradecer uh, imensamente a presença de todos vocês hoje, as perguntas muito interessantes que enviaram, que fizeram. Agradecer ao Centro Ruth Cardoso por mais essa grande parceria, essa instituição que tanto tem feito para promover um debate público de grande qualidade, uma atuação de alta qualidade direto nas comunidades, em grupos os mais variados. E uh, espero que vocês todos tenham aproveitado bastante, comprem o livro depois, leiam e pensem apenas mentalmente no problema do trolley aí, sabe? Por favor, não saiam fazendo essa experiência na prática. Muito obrigado, uma boa noite a todos. Obrigado, professor. Uh, muito obrigado.